The Simon Filer Podcast, giving authors a platform. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. Dr. Tom Lonsdale is joining me on my podcast today. It is a privilege to have Dr. Lonsdale chatting with me. He commenced his veterinary career 50 years ago, and the last 30 years he's been championing the health benefits of feeding our domestic pets raw meaty bones. In the process, as I've discovered, editing and producing his three audio books, he's come up against entrenched attitudes of vets and as discussed in detail in all three releases, the junk pet food industry has been a mighty obstacle in getting the message of raw meaty bones out. Dr Lonsdale's first published print book in 2001, Raw Meaty Bones Promote Health, sets out the science, health, politics and economics. In 2005, he published his Easy Reader, Work Wonders, Feed Your Dog Raw Meaty Bones, and his latest book, Multi-Billion Dollar Pet Food Fraud, Hiding in Plain Sight, is out now. All three books are available in paperback, ebook, and audiobook. And if you want more information, go to thepetfoodcon.com. Welcome to the Simone Filer podcast with Dr. Lonsdale. Wonderful to be here. Thank you for the introduction. My pleasure. <laughs> um, first up, thank you so much for doing your audiobooks with me. I remember having a chat with you on the phone and suggesting that you self-narrate, you weren't too keen, however, like six months on and you've narrated all three. How was your experience recording for Sydney Audiobook Production with Esther and Joanna? Uh, overall, of course, it was wonderful. Let me just first off say that I had some technical difficulties with my voice, just actually intonating and conveying the message was difficult so let, let me just establish that and get it out of the way but they of course were incredibly helpful very sympathetic to my plight because it was a plight you know just struggling through that but that that's all the the negative stuff i've got to say on that otherwise it was just an amazing uplifting experience it's the sort of thing that i think everyone if they can they'd be really fortunate to be able to go into a recording studio and experience that wonderful i don't know creative atmosphere creative activity endeavor um filled with optimism for what we were laying on tape and hopefully what was going to be listened to by the public yeah well well done i think you've done a great job and i've learned so much editing and producing all three titles and there's obviously so much to chat about given all the content. However, I thought we'd start at book number two, Work Wonders, Feed Your Dog Raw Meaty Bones, because that's the first one we recorded. So why did you write Work Wonders and what's its primary purpose? Thank you. Well, um, let me say it was published in 2005. So that's a long time ago. Conditions were different back then. And I published the first book in 2001, Raw Meaty Bones Promote Health. I had thought that the book I published four years earlier, Raw Meaty Bones Promote Health, was the definitive statement, both on how to feed animals and about the um, corrupt environment, the cultural conditioning, where we were all accustomed to even putting the wrong label on cans and packets, calling it food. It should be called poison. So I'd written all that down and, and put it out there. Some people picked up on it. The great majority didn't. The, the the people who it were in was intended to read this, the, the vets, didn't. The people with an alternative mindset, they did. For the most part, they had been barfers, uh, born-again raw feeders who were into mincing vegetables and so on. And I'd written that book, um, Raw Meaty Bones, to nullify their misleading statements and get people on the right track. Few people came on board in 2001 but it didn't last long those people the great majority in the the uh, mainstream refused to take account the people in the alternative with the alternative mindset they did they came to realize that they'd been hoodwinked by the barfer mythology came on over to the raw meaty bones way of thinking but then after a while they decided in their wisdom that well suddenly there was no place for them because they didn't know anything about dentistry they didn't actually know much about medicine and surgery of animals but they did like the sound of their own voices 
And they then decided that raw media violence information was bad and needed to be suppressed. And I was horrified. So suddenly there was effectively no supporters and a lot of detractors. The community was left very vulnerable. So I decided that I would write Work Wonders, Feed Your Dog, Raw Meaty Bones, to help people in the practical aspect, and also to stand as something of a rebuttal to the barfers who then turned into what was called the prey modelers. So it had positive approaches, and it also had defensive approaches built into that book. And that explains something of the politics. And I think this is important because if you think, that was back in 2005. And ever since, nothing has really changed. The, um, the buffers and the prey modelers and the alternative holistics are mostly anti-raw meaty bones. And of course, the conventional vets are completely against raw meaty bones. Nature's finest, best, most gentle, most effective medicine for carnivores is condemned by all parties. Extraordinary. It's absolutely extraordinary how mad uh, the human so-called civilization can be. Well, all three books are incredibly interesting and detail this particular topic um, amazingly, very comprehensively. But Work Wonders, obviously, Raw Meaty Bones was a, a bigger book, very comprehensive. Work Wonders is an easy reader and a very easy listen, eight comprehensive chapters. Kicks off with the first chapter, Getting Started. And such a great introduction, I might say, Dr. Tom, to all three books getting started because you really were. Um, but what's your simple recommendation to get their pets started on the raw meaty bones diet, the obvious diet, just quietly, after reading three of your books? It's still difficult for people to uh, read something on the page and then translate it into practical action. Um, so... I think it is very important that people should read at least Work Wonders uh, and understand what's contained therein. And then because we are in the business of converting people over, we're assuming that anyone reading that has previously believed in the canned and the packet and what the vets told them. So I recommend that people try and unlearn that in the same way that if you were wanting to build something really important, like some big building, a cathedral even, um, first of all, you would clean, the, clear the ground, you would get rid of all the rubbish, and then you would learn, lay secure foundations. But first of all, you get rid of the rubbish in the same way with um, converting to raw meaty bones thinking. Don't try and build on the old beliefs that you have because it, it'll leave you destabilized. It's better just to put that all to one side if you can. After you've done it for six months or so, you will see the wisdom of that. Initially, though, it might be difficult. All of us, you know, are pretty convinced by the things that we believe to be true. Very hard to shake some of our rusted on beliefs. Yeah. Okay. Well, what do you think are some of the necessary features of a healthy diet to maintain our pets in tip top condition and minimize trips to the vets? Obviously, it starts with raw meaty bones, but the quality, quantity, and frequency of feeding as you go into detailing work wonders in chapter two. Right, okay. Well, of course, it, it comes down to three things, the quantity, quality, and frequency of feeding. Get all of those things right, and you've got it all lined up for a happy, healthy future. Um, it all starts with raw meaty bones. Uh, the way to envisage all of this is to think of your dog, if it's a dog you have, is a modified wolf, Think what a wolf pack would do well they would stir there'd be a signal from the pack leader uh, and away they would go they would run maybe even 40 kilometers through deep snow to catch their prey this is very very important what they so want to do is rip and tear and chew at their prey and with this so the physical exercise of getting there the, the feeding frenzy the celebration of catching it is so important to them. So it needs to be 
the same for our domestic carnivores. That's what we must provide them with, uh, that ab ability to rip, tear and chew at their raw meaty bones. And that has many benefits. We come to that in a moment. Yeah. But then it becomes a case of the quality of that. It needs to be the right quality, the right amount of ripping, tearing and chewing, the right quantity, how much of that, not five minutes, but probably half an hour a day if you can arrange that. Mm -hmm. And then the frequency, mostly once, once a day, but that's not sacrosanct. In fact, you can uh, feed just five days a week, a couple of days, nothing. Or maybe on those days you might give some offal or some table scraps. But four or five days a week, there needs to be a really robust workout. And the great thing about this is if they're predominantly eating raw meaty bones, then the ingredients will be looked after as well. So put the emphasis on ripping and tearing and chewing at raw meaty bones and pretty much ignore all considerations of what the ingredients are because it will have been taken care of in the same way that the wolf pack eats the deer, they get the nutrients they require. But prior to that, they get that brain stimulation, cleaning of the teeth. Yeah, and you do actually go into detail in Work Wonders about, you know, out in the wild with where they're the wolves, where the dogs all evolved from, you know, sometimes they don't eat every single day. You know, they might all eat for a week on the one carcass and a couple of days go by and they don't catch anything. So so that also comes into play, which you go into detail in Work Wonders. But I thought oh, we sure. should move through the chapters. In Chapter 3, Rural Resources, you go into the detail of the best diet and techniques to feed your pets. For example, where to get the best pet food supplies, how to prepare that food, along with whether table scraps or frozen food even is good for your pets. What was your research involved in these findings, Dr. Longstar? Oh, okay. Well, there will have been some uh, literature research, of course, and uh, mostly that was done for raw meaty bones the four years before. Um, otherwise, it was practical experience, our own experience and that of our clients, um, finding the best way, the pragmatic option, uh, because in nature, of course, everything comes covered with fur, feathers and fins and, and has guts inside it as well. But the guts in, in domestication, the guts liable to ferment, to putrefy, and uh, potentially harmful bacteria can arise out of that. So we ordinarily do not feed guts, not from sheep, deer, cattle, and so on. You do from smaller animals. But otherwise then, you're looking at the practical aspects of, of where uh, these things can be found. Well, actually, in the butcher shop, in the supermarket, meat counter, the commonest, easiest solution is the chicken frames after the meat has been removed for human consumption. And would you believe they're good for cats, ferrets, all the way up to Great Danes and Irish wolfhounds. That works. It's an adequate compromise uh, that people can uh, employ. Otherwise, so that's at the supermarket or in normal retail outlets. Thereafter, of course, people should search around talk to people, go on the internet, find out who's getting what from where. And then, of course, you can go all the way to getting out there with your own rifle and shooting uh, prey, prey for your pets. <laughs> well, some do. Yeah. And I farm. think that's, that's a trend <laughs> that might be if you're on a farm yeah. or if you're a butcher or if you're friends with a farmer, uh, all of those things. And what then about, if you live in... What about roadkill? Very much so. Very much. I recommend that. Um, ordinarily, you'd be able to detect when it's been fairly freshly killed. Uh, be careful. Uh, don't get yourself hurt getting out of the car in your enthusiasm to <laughs> rush and pick up a hare or a pheasant or whatever that's been knocked over. Um, in Tasmania, for instance, there's lots of wallabies on the on the ground. Not quite sure what the law is in Tasmania. I'll tell you here in New South Wales. Uh, it's illegal to collect roadkill, native animal roadkill. So as, as much as you would like to go and harvest that dead kangaroo, it's actually against the law. And I think that's all to do with people loading kangaroos in the back of their car um, 
and saying, oh, it was roadkill when in fact they've been out and shot it. So right. I think that's the reason why that regulation is um, employed. So, yeah, but roadkill, very good. That's the best. That's yeah. absolutely the best. And, and then, of course, you need a freezer because, of course, you, you like to get large quantities that you can't feed over the next couple of days. Right, well, you, you need a freezer and you probably need to chop up the larger items just to make it manageable. Unless you've got several dogs, in which case communal feeding is definitely the best. All right. Trying it out and let yeah. them all go for it? Let them go for it. Um, but beware. I mean, introducing adult dogs to that concept can be risky. But of course, if they start out as puppies, then that's that's how they eat from the get-go and they're accustomed to that and they get along just fine. Mm, very interesting. And yet yeah, more detail in Work Wonders, a very interesting book, I can tell you. Now, the chapter on switching, grinding and breeding discusses how to help your pet change from their usual sludgy canned pet food or the kibble diet and why it's in their best health interest to chew raw meaty bones, not only for dental hygiene, but also for nutrients. How hard is it? Um, for a pet to change their diet if they're used to, you know, what they're eating? Um, and why exactly would that be hard if it was? Okay, well, it, it's hard on two counts, really. One is for owners. Owners doing something they're unaccustomed to, they really oftentimes don't have much theory or practical know-how. So that, for them, can make them a bit hesitant. Then you, your dogs can... Be, be hesitant, especially the smaller breeds um, that have had a few years of becoming accustomed and therefore addicted to the wrong stuff. And then suddenly the thought that they've got to rip and tear and chew can be a bit off-putting for them, especially if they've got to toothache and they've got problems in that department. So ordinarily, for dogs, you just switch cold turkey there and then. Um, one day you're feeding your can and you're dry, and the next day you're getting appropriate large pieces of raw meaty bones for the average dog that works just fine and like i say some that have been previously addicted to the other stuff you might have to transition them a bit well of course keeping them a bit hungry it is a, a part of the the process here so there's no point in trying to feed an animal if it's not hungry same as yourself if you're based with the most wonderful gourmet meal but if you're not hungry you're still not going to eat it same with them so keep them hungry for a couple of days let me say that you can keep a canine hungry for several weeks and if it's in good bodily condition at the beginning then several weeks of starvation will not kill that dog um so you know keeping dogs short of food for two or three days is not harmful um and if that's what's necessary in order to help change their feeding habits then so be it you can of course get there's several things that they have to get used to the flavor the smell the texture and you can introduce those things slowly by way of um for instance giving them chopped meat or minced or whatever to get the the taste acceptance going and once we're talking about dogs um just say that the book is useful for Cat owners and ferret owners too, they can pretty much follow all the same advice in there. Um, and then transitioning from cats and ferrets can be rather more difficult. And for that, I suggest folks go to um, www.rawmeatybones.com and also uh, thepetfoodcon.com. And on both of those sites, I've got switching a cat's diet because I think it's pretty important that um, when you're dealing with little addicted animals, in the same way that if a family is dealing with somebody addicted to smoking or gambling or whatever, it's difficult. They obviously would show characteristics of mood swings and you know depression, anger maybe. All of that. And the family are going to tiptoe around the addict's needs and accommodate those needs. So there's a whole lot of transformations that need to take place in the, the home, in the environment. Um, and that is the case with little addicted cats and addicted ferrets. You're going to need to take some time and go and read what I've written about switching cats' diets. 
And the same applies there for that particularly difficult addicted dog. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, they're so rare. <laughs> they are so rare. They they mostly take to it with gusto. Right. And do you think the dogs take to it with gusto more so than the cats and ferrets? Yeah, yeah, absolutely they do. Yeah, yeah. So, so um, like I say, uh, um, dogs ordinarily, instinctively just go for the raw meaty bone um, almost instantaneously and 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 growl and carry on. It's a prized possession. That that's what they're mostly focused on. You know, give a dog a bone is the same, right? In other words, it will apply the same um, attitudes and theory to humans. It's somebody who who won't let go. Who's completely <laughs> obsessed i'm happy and, and, and that's exactly how the dogs are they're obsessed with this prize that they believe they have run through 40 kilometers of deep snow in order to pull down and and, and kill and then devour in their own minds that you know they're on a trip Aww, <laughs> that's that's gorgeous Gorgeous. Yeah. But there's been, there's been quite a bit of stigma around for years about feeding dogs raw many bones, um, how they can get stuck or splinter, or even I've heard that they can make the dogs vicious. Uh, you address this in Chapter 5 of Work Wonders with risk management, but what are your immediate thoughts when, when I mention this now? Well, it's a terrible bad thing that the, the safest, most effective, most gentle medicine should be so stigmatized. Uh, so why is that? Well, look, with any medicine, uh, things can go wrong. You know, the, the procurement, the handling, the storage, the administration. If you don't do it right, um, problems can arise. And in life, there's no such thing as a risk-free anything. There's risks with everything. Um, so let's let's be um, frank about that. Then going back to the history of these risks, how did they arise? Well, cook bones are indeed hazardous. They they tend to splinter um, and can penetrate internal organs. Uh, they also tend to get stuck. Um, so the sort of things that get stuck in dogs' esophaguses are uh, chop bones especially the, the sort of knuckle end of the chop, chop bone. Uh, big, hard, heavy bones tend to break teeth, um, especially the carnassial teeth. So yes, inappropriate um, administration of raw meaty bones um, could give rise to problems. So be aware of that. But, so these are the physical problems. Uh, and the way you overcome that is make sure, if you possibly can, that everything is covered in fur, feathers and fins, the wolves and the wild cats and the, the, the pole cats in the wild have no problem with blockage because they start from the outside and eat their way in. Right, so the closer you can get to that natural ideal, the better. So we're talking about the physical aspects. Then in terms of bacteria in the wild, there are very few, if any, harmful bacteria. It's a, more a phenomenon of the factory farm where animals are wandering about in their own excrement up to their knees and all of that excrement you can reckon is full of salmonella campylobacter e coli and that's the nature of things assume that but it's the same for your own food in the in the refrigerator so don't become overly alarmed and make that a big dramatic issue the truth is again puppies and kittens introduced to natural factory farm food whilst they're babies in the nest tend not to have any subsequent reaction because they're introduced to the bacteria at the same time as their antibody levels are high because they would have acquired those antibodies from their mother in the first milk in the colostrum so feeding puppies and kittens from the get-go in the nest is the best if animals are introduced to these things in later life, sometimes you have a few days of diarrhea. Ordinarily, it's no no worse than that. And there are definitely not reasons to not feed nature's best medicine. Thank you. Also, there are groups which you did briefly mention when we first started talking outside of the three uh, big pet food companies, which I'm sure our listeners uh, may be surprised to learn are Mars, Nestle, Greener, and Colgate. 
I was taken aback. Um, but these groups, as you mentioned earlier, bathers, prey modelers and holistics, claim that their pet food products are more natural and better for pets than the big three. And I did look up a few sites and I see some of them just use meat and veggies and they're cooked at a low temperature. And what are your thoughts on the new age pet food companies? Well, I'd like to see them in the court. I, I think that their claims need to be examined in, in a courthouse and let them uh, try and defend what they're doing, because I think it's monstrous. I, I think they've hijacked the debate. Uh, they're holding uh, pet owners and pets to ransom. I think that th this callous indifference to animal cruelty is a shocker, um, it, as they are trying to um, make their fortunes. I, I just think, like I say, Unless raw meaty bones is front and centre of any discussion for carnivores, then that kind of that discussion is off beam. It, it's as dramatic as that. I mean, like like we said, the wolf pack going to run for forty kilometres. The, the cat's going to sit at the mouse hole, maybe for days at a time. It's so important to them to get their ripping and tearing and chewing. And that's got to be your first priority. And once you've accomplished that, everything else falls into place. Well, you graduated with your university degree in veterinary science in 1972. So you've been in the industry for over 50 years, obviously, you know your stuff. Um, what are some of the diseases that you've come across that you now believe as a result of your researching and your testing from feeding pets, the pet food at our supermarkets, at our vet clinics and... Every disease, well, every disease, barring um, road accidents with breaking legs and so on, pretty much everything. Because you've got to ask yourself, this stuff that's being fed to the animal, is it better than the natural, the same as the natural, or worse than the natural? Well, of course, it's not better than the natural. Could it possibly calibrate and be as good at? No. Therefore, it's worse. How much worse? Considerably worse. So if this is happening 24 hours a day, seven days a week, then that's having incremental bad effects on all systems in the body all of the time. So how do you see this? How can you detect this? Well, let me just say that the main way of detecting this for people is in retrospect. Anyone who's been feeding their cat or dog on the junk food for any length of time and mostly assuming that animal to be well because the animal hasn't told them it's feeling unwell. It's got a ringing headache and the joints ache and the muscles ache and it must go back to bed just to get wet, get away from it. it. hasn't told the owner any of that stuff. So the owner then fortuitously then decides, right, enough of this, we will change the raw meaty bones. And then in retrospect, they look back and say, gee, wow, didn't realise how ill the dog was, how ill the pussycat was. I thought the hair was just brittle and dry because the animal was getting old. I thought that the poo would bound to smell stinky. I'm astounded now that this new diet has produced poo of about a third the quantity and virtually odorless. My dog or cat now, in retrospect, has picked up its bed and walked. It is suddenly now lively, active, and, and happy, I didn't realize how cruel I was being to that dog previously. And that's the sort of thing. So it's a, a very general impression. Then in terms of the specific diseases, well, obviously the skin diseases, the gastrointestinal diseases that you can see. Let me say though, that the vets are not trained to think about any of this. Vets use blunt instruments. They use thermometers, stethoscopes, X-ray machines, blood tests. Um, these days, they even go for MRIs and CAT scans, extraordinary use of technology. But that doesn't tell you how an animal feels. And they've never been able to tell that and never will. So, in fact, your fingertips are better feeling the animal. Your eyes can tell you by looking at it. You use your ears to hear what the owner says they've been feeding. And straight away, you know things are wrong if you approach it in that way. And then you say, well, the way to find out which is right and which is wrong here is let's do a test therapy. Let's stop doing the poisoning bizzo. I labor it poisoning. Try the raw meat bone solution and see what we've got. 
ordinarily, if owners come back, if they come back at all, they come back with a bearing a big smile. Most often, they don't need to come back. It's extraordinary. They say, yeah. whoa, that's, that's the answer. Wow. We're talking with Dr. Tom Lonsdale about his work wonders, Feed Your Dog, Raw Midi Bones, which I've had the pleasure of editing and producing his audio book. It's amazing. I recommend it highly for a completely different insight into how you feed your pets. Uh, chapter seven, Dr. Lonsdale, your chapter on dentistry was an absolute eye opener for me. Fundamentally good health and not only in pets, but it's known for humans too, comes from good dental hygiene. And it really made sense to me that domestic dogs and cats and ferrets don't actually have a way to clean their teeth, you know, and a lot of dogs, including my Pomeranians, they had bad teeth. And I guess that's probably because I wasn't feeding them raw meaty bones for them to clean their teeth. That's that's how they feed their teeth, yeah. Um, what was the pivotal enlightenment that came to you when you realised that a vast number of pets you were seeing had teeth issues and gum disease? How did you get to there? Mm, well, it wasn't a sudden road to Damascus enlightenment. It, it was slow. It, it, it took time. It Alas, it took way too much time. Uh, but eventually things seeped in through the fortress of my mind and, and I came to realise and a number of different factors. Um, talking with other vets um, who commented on this, seeing the amount of uh, the number of dental cases that we treated, uh, noting that the veterinary equipment industry was cranking up its advertising and saying you get rich quick by buying uh, $12,000 dental carts and doing dentistry on all these animals. And, and, and so my awareness started to increase. Prior to that, of course, I was completely focused on the epidemic of heartworm disease and just generally running the practice. Um, so otherwise preoccupied and missing the obvious but couldn't perhaps see the wood for the trees. I mean, it's, it's like when you're next to a mountain range. If you're at the foot of the range, you don't really see how big that mountain range is, but it's only when you stand back um, that you start to see. And, uh, and so gradually I gained that idea that things weren't right. A couple of cases um, stood out um, where... I thought I'd been treating them well, and by the time they were 10 years of age, they were falling apart and got rotten breath and stinky breath and bad teeth. And, and I woke up at this point, um, was conscience stricken, decided this was not good, decided to, to research it more, and everything started to fall into place. It was like exploring a new planet. Extraordinary, <laughs> wherever we looked, wherever we turned mm. and stumbled, there was new, new information. Whoa, this is important, I thought. Amazing. So we, you know, we're on a self-education mission. Having discovered all this stuff, I then saw it as my further mission to alert the vets to how important this was. They didn't want to know. Mm. Yep. Well, you certainly embarked on a journey and it's opened my eyes. You know, I was very fortunate that you called me that day and said, hey, I'd like to do my audio book. I've learned so much. Um, so Work Wonders, that is the book we're talking about. Dr. Tom Lonsdale has released three books, all very important. But given what we've been talking about today, Dr. Lonsdale, what are the first steps that we as pet owners can do today to start helping our pets live healthier, happier, and longer lives. Well, thank you, and thanks for the question. Um, just now, you said you've learned so much by uh, producing these three audiobooks, and and you are one of the very few people on the planet who've actually worked their way through all three books. Mm. And as you found that that's been quite edifying. Um, that there's a consistency that runs through all the three. Um, so after. It, you know, it, it's 20 odd years since the first one. And all we do is find more and more information to confirm the reality. So what people should aim to do, I would suggest, is go to the websites, 
read all the information there. Certainly, I would most definitely recommend they listen to the um, Work Wonders audio book yep. produced by you and I. Yeah, and, and I, read uh, and narrated by yourself fabulously. Well, um, and passionately, anyway. and passionately. It's such a oh, great man. audio book, great right. information. I can't rave about it enough. <laughs> oh, you're so kind. It is important, I yeah. tell you, for, for the cats and dogs and ferrets. I, you know, if if we can transform their lives, not just today but forever, that's fantastic. Mm. I, you know, we we sh that's why you know we're redoubling our efforts. Why it's fantastic that you spent a long time in your audio lab uh, editing and and getting these fit for listening, and uh, it'll be great to to get some feedback from the listeners uh, as to how in fact they. Um, interpreted the information and whether they um made it work for themselves i'm sure they will good luck yeah well work wonders is the easy reader and that gives you instructions how to feed your pets and pretty much everything that we've discussed today raw meaty bones was your first book um the multi-billion dollar pet food fraud is your latest release and that is such an eye-opener congratulations you've done such amazing work important work dr lonsdale where can people find out more about the books where can people get the books and find out more about you and maybe even you know contact you if they'd like to have a chat more about this you know i think these days the one-stop shop is uh the petfoodcon.com so that's triple w the t-h-e p-e-t f-o-o-d Con, c o n dot com. Go there, thepetfoodcon.com. Palamede is the publicity company who've done a great job and they make it user friendly and you can find the information. You can also then go back and get the archive information from www.rawmedibonus.com. Yeah, I think that's what people should do. Just, just go there, have a look around. Um, there's, there's a form on there uh, that they can fill in if they've got questions and we'll endeavour to get answers back to them. Awesome. Sounds fantastic. Now, your fabulous song, not only have you been a vet for over 50 years and have done all this amazing research on raw meaty bones and, you know, really trying to help pets live longer lives. Uh, so you're an author. You are a songwriter. <laughs> so Dr. Lonsdale sent through his short poem to me and I said, that would make a great tune. Now I come from a music background, but that conversation inspired you to chat with your muso son, Luke, and now we've got the mastered copy of your hit single, Work Wonders, uh, the hit song for your pets. Wouldn't it be great to just have this song at the top of the iTunes chart, Dr. Lonsdale, such a simple and important message. Sure. Good. Okay. Well, it, yeah, it just, just lightens the, the mood and um, it, it's optimistic and, and forward thinking. And I hope that people will have a listen. Uh, if and when they listen to Work Wonders, the, um, the audio book, they'll find it as one of the later chapters added in by your good self. And that's great. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I highly recommend the listen. I've been playing it here and it's stuck in my kids' heads and, like I said, a very simple and most important message. I'm going to actually crank it up now for the listeners, Dr. Tom Lonsdale. Thank you so much for doing your audio books with me and being a part of my podcast today. It's been a privilege. Simon, terrific. Thanks, episode. See you. Bye. Up
opportunity Feed your cat or all many bones Put a smile on the face of your kitty Work wonders, work wonders Winter, spring, summer and fall Feed your pets or all many bones Is the best you can do for them all for joining the Simon Filer podcast. What's your story? Contact Simon for a chat at brisbaneaudiobookproduction.com.